will start for a very brief trip to Elam. And uh, last month, while I was preparing this paper, a long series of sad events uh, spread around the world. Immediately, some journalists, uh, experts, uh, started talking about a worldwide crisis. This is obviously a way not to deal with the historical development of each single event, and this fact alone precludes uh, an understanding. But it is true that in Italy, at least, many of us uh, have uh, the perception of a worsening crisis in the world. Are we really in crisis? Obviously, it depends on the definition of crisis you give. If you Google crisis, most results are related to the economic crisis because it is one of the main concerns of the last years, at least since 2008. There are specific markers of, market, uh, markers of economic crisis, debt, deflation, unemployment, poverty, and so on. But for common people, it's still a matter of perception strongly influenced by the way the media talk about it, at least in Italy. An economic crisis could lead to other types of crisis, social, political, military crisis. Time will give us an answer, and much depends on the choice of our generation, in my opinion. Yes, we need time, because even in the present, with all the data at our disposal, it is difficult to interpret the events. It is easier to judge an event on the ground of its uh, aftermath. So time helps us to make a selection in the data provided by the present. Marginally, for this reason, I think it is fundamental to study the Achaemenid period if you are a researcher in Neolamite history, or to study Hellenism if you are a specialist in the Achaemenid <coughs> dynasty. Unfortunately, when we move to the distant past of the ancient Near East, we lack of details. Time made a too heavy selection, and chance made its way through it. So we have some archaeological markers, settlement patterns, settlement data, and occasionally textual accounts of military events and ethnic clashes, but we have to fill too many voids with hypotheses and common sense. From a methodological point of view, we apply a series of common inferences, often without being too much aware of them from the point of view of the methodology. To this regard, it is interesting to me the approach of the website Livius, which lists at the end of some pages the inferences applied in each of these pages. One of the main questions to, question to uh, be asked is how much the sample that we have in our hands, both archaeological and textual, is representative of the complexity of the past. Coming back to the idea of crisis, which is the best marker of an ongoing crisis? I would like to suggest a simple empirical solution. Just look at the birth number in Italy in the last hundred and a half years since the unification of the Italian state in 1861. The great concavities correspond to the two world wars. In my opinion, the birth rate is a good marker of hope in the future, and I consider that you have little hope in the future when you are living in a crisis, in a time of, cri of crisis. So I am particularly interested in this uh, graph published by Miro Shegi in 1990 in his essay on the hand of Elam on Iranica Antiqua. It shows the demographic development in southwestern Iran from the 5th millennium BC to the 4th millennium AD. The dashed curve, number three, represents the settled population in Mardasht plain <coughs> around Persepolis. The bold curve, number two, represents the settled population in Susiana plain, while 
curve number one is an esteme of the global population of southwestern Iran, including also nomad nomadic population whose footprint in the archaeological and textual documentation is lighter, as you know. It is easy to see that around the 12th century BC, there was a big drop in population. We know that this is a tendency shared by all the ancient Near East, where the so-called crisis of the late Bronze Age, that we have heard about it before, was developing since centuries. So it's not only a matter of alarm, obviously. We know some of the factors acting in this crisis, especially movements of people, shortage of food, which led to the abandonment of cities, the decrease of the agricultural surface, and the conversion to, to nomadism. I have ever wondered how Miroshiji was able to draw this graph, which kind of data he used. So surely, he used data from the archaeological surveys of the Mardash Plain carried on in the 70s by Sumner and his collaborators, and of the Susiana Plain carried on in the 60s and 70s by the French mission. But you can see that there are no absolute number on the ordinate, ordinate axis on the left. And Mirosegi was honest in labeling this graph as a model, so it's only a model. So unfortunately, it is a kind of a cat biting his tail, since the, the demographic curve was mainly inferred from the very consideration about the late Bronze Age crisis from which we started to talk. Putting aside the archaeological data in the demographic uh, that we have seen in the demographic curve, let me, ta let me turn the attention to the textual sources which can be related to the late Bronze Age crisis in Elam. I cannot evaluate all the available evidence here, so I will focus only on one of the much debated episodes, the Babylonian military interventions in Elam having the King Nebuchadnezzar I at the end of the 12th century BC as main Hector. We know two contemporary sources pertaining apparently to the same textual genre. They are not Elamite documents, but royal grants of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. The first grant, this one, is written on a stone tablet, so a particular important text carrier. As a grant, it had to be justified by a historical premise. I say historical from, because it's historical only from the point, ideological point of view of the issue of the grant of the king and the, its, his chancellery. In this grant, the two sons of the manager of the temple of the god Aliya, Uruya, there are different readings, escaped from the city of Din Shari under the jurisdiction of the king of Elam, Inapanishar Elamti, and took refuge in Babylonia. So Nebuchadnezzar started a campaign on their behalf in Amukishunu, and they went with him to Elam. This passage conveys the idea of an inside help given by the two traitors, at least from an Elamite point of view. The consequences of uh, this uh, campaign, according to the grant, were that Nebuchadnezzar overthrew Elam, carried the status of Martu Marduk and Aliyah into Babylon, afterwards brought the statue of Aliyah into the city of Husi, so in another city. The historical premise seems to be quite generic with regard to the details that are not directly related to the beneficiary of an, and the object of the grant. For example, the name of the king of Elam is not mentioned nor the cities that were overthrown. We can deduce that Din Shari was conquered since Nebuchadnezzar was able to take as a booty the statue of Aliyah that was worshipped there. 
As a further proof of Dinshari as a town in the orbit of Susa, we can remind here that it is attested in some Hilamite inscription, the Stela of Shutruro, and in two, uh, acro in two tablets, administrative tablets from uh, Susa, the Acropole tablets. It is usually inferred also that Susa was conquered since Nebuchadnezzar brought back the statue of the god, Babylonian god Marduk, that was supp supposed to be there. This is a long history, a long story, a long story recounted by the literary text called Nebuchadnezzar and Marduk, or the prophecy of Marduk, plus three Babylonian documents of a Achaemenid period, the so-called Kedor Laomer text, which reports which report the heavy deeds of the Lamite king Kutir Nakunte from the middle of the 12th century BC. At a close inspection of this fragmentary text, it is not explicitly said where the statue of Marduk was looted, nor where it was brought, while there are some clear references to the plundering of temples in Nippur. And References also to the booty brought back to Elam. So there is no clear, stated clear, clearly that the statue of Marduk was in Babylon, for example, or that was brought in Susa. So it is all scholarly uh, uh, supposition. The idea that Marduk was taken away is expressed by the final prey translated by Foster, Benjamin Foster, sorry, here, uh, as let him return to uh, his place. Uh, as the last line in the slide. So, and you can see that also Foster had to put a question mark be, be, um, uh, uh, after him because he is not sure that him was uh, uh, Marduk. So, since we are dealing with literary com compositions, it seems to me that the statue of Marduk was, first of all, a literary device, a symbol of kingship, civic identity, and independence. The story of a god leaving his city in anger, anger just to come back later thanks to a pious king like Cyrus, for example, is a well-known topos in ancient Near East. Therefore, I would not be so sure that Nebuchadnezzar granted uh, the ne uh, sorry that I'm not so sure that the Nebuchadnezzar grant dealt with the same statue of the Kedorlomer text, for example, and the other Babylonian literature, nor that we are dealing here with an actual statue, but in my opinion, in my view, with uh, a symbol. Furthermore, I would not take a certain that such a statue was in Babylon and that it was brought to Susa, and therefore that Nebuchadnezzar conquered Susa to regain the statue that was supposed to be there. The second text is a Kuduru, a stone Kuduru from Sippar, and the text records a grant of Nebuchadnezzar to the villages of Bitkarziapku, exempting them from taxation and from the jurisdiction of the province Namar as a reward for the bravery of their chief, Shitti Marduk, who, during a Babylonian ra raid into Hilamite territory, stood aside Nebuchadnezzar and defeated the Hilamite king Kutelutu Shinshushinak, one of the sons of Kutirnakunt and one of the last kings of the so-called Shutrukid dynasty in Elam. Here is uh, the Kudur. According to the inscription, the raid started from the city of Der, modern Tel Akar, close to the Iranian border, reaching a distance of 30 Beru leagues, around about 320 kilometers, at the foot of the forest mountains to the east of Susa. Along a normal road, such a distance, if one would like to take a literally of it would have led no, for, no farther than Susa, which, however, is not uh, explicitly mentioned. Again, Susa doesn't compare explicitly in uh, the text. 
the raid took place in the fourth month. Uh, ah, sorry, this is uh, the geographic map. You can see the 320 kilometers, uh, the 30 leagues from there. So the raid took place in the fourth month, Duzu, corresponding to June, July in our calendar, that is in a very hot period of the year. This detail is emphasized by literary means, and let me read the text because I think it's very uh, interesting and also from a literary point of view. During the whole time of the campaign, the blistering heat burned like fire, and the very roadways scorched like flames. There was no water in the places which were normally waterlogged, and the drinking places were cut off. The best of the great horses gave out, and the legs of the strong warriors sought for a respite. Yet the king, the preeminent one, goes on, the gods supporting him. Nebuchadnezzar proceeds on, he has no equal. So you can see also in this translation by Foster the literary character of this text. And this literary character was emphasized also by Brinkman, who uh, termed it as the literary high point of uh, the era of the Middle Babylonian period. According to the inscription, Shitti Marduk stood at the flank of the king in a battle on the bank of the river Ulaya. At this point, the text introduced abruptly the enemy king. Should be here, sorry. The two kings came together, engaging in battle. Fire flared up between them. The face of the sun was darkened by the dust. Dust the storms whirled, the storm whipped around. In the storm of the battle, the warrior in his chariot could not see the second man in the chariot with him. This is a very famous passage in uh, Akkadian literature. The name of the enemy king appears only later in the context of a praise to Shiti Marduk at the end of the battle. I'm quoting, he put Hulteludish, the king of the Lam, to flight, and he, Hulteludish, disappeared. Thus, King Nebuchadnezzar stood in triumphs and so on. So the fate of Hulteludish, which is clearly Hultelutus in Shushinak, the Ilamite king, is expressed by a form of the verb emedu, followed by kur shu, shadashu, kur is a logogram of shadu, and this syntagm is uh, in generally interpreted in the metaphorical meaning to disappear. In my opinion, this English translation may be misleading, and I try to explain why in a, a, a brief, uh, I hope, philological section of my talk. Frames, uh, this is uh, the translation by Grant Frame, I forgot to mention before. Frame translation of the syntax is to disappear and follows the one proposed in the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary, which refers to a note by Weidner for further references proving the metaphorical meaning. It has been quite unexpected to me to find that Weidner, listing several occurrences of this syntax where the context makes clear that the subject died, Weidner did not suggest exactly the Chicago Syrian Dictionary translation. Weidner started from some occurrences where the translation he was murdered fits, then listed other occurrences where the translation he came to a shameful hand fits better, concluding that the fundamental meaning was he died a violent death. You can see the original German. Therefore, it seems to me that uh, the Chicago Syrian Dictionary suggests another meaning to disappear forever without fully providing the rationale behind it. Reading Weiner, it is clear that to disappear forever has to be intended as an English euphemism for to die, just as it was probably so shadashu imid in Akkadian and not as an indication of uh, an unknown fate in the future. We don't know, it disappeared. The idea of violent death is absent, but I agree with the Chicago interpretation since I think that the core meaning is to die. 
As, you, as some of you know, uh, Vallat, François Vallat, suggested uh, that uh, this metaphorical interpretation is wrong, uh, preferring a literal meaning. Vallat relies on one of the main meanings of the verb emedu, which is to take cover, to refuge. This action is easily understandable from a strategic point of view, and it is enforced by near Syrian do documents stating something like that uh, the king of Elam is in the mountains, or the king of Elam uh, went to the mountains uh, or to a place which is in the midst of the mountains. So the point is, how did they, the Akkadian scribes, distinguish the action of taking refuge in the mountains from the action of being murdered and die? To me, it seems that the only difference could be in the usage of the suffix pronoun, to take refuge in the mountains versus to take refuge in his mountains, that is, to die in this case. In such a literary context, it would be easy to assume a metaphorical meaning, like uh, Weiden, and contrary to Valla. I try to reconciliate uh, the literal and metaphorical meanings, since the one seems to be the opposite of the other, looking for the origin of the latter one. No other meaning of Emedu can be related to the idea of death. You can see here the general meaning, the me me uh, general meaning of the verb. Then I shifted the search to the word shadu, mountains, finding many references to the mountains which one has to pass to go to the nether world. Or, in particular, we have the Shad Aralu, the mountain of the nether world. Therefore, I wonder if Shadashu Imid means to take cover in the nether world. Again, an euphemism to say to die, perhaps also with a certain certain irony and content, judging to, uh, from the context uh, where it is uh, used. So I close this uh, se philological section, and we can uh, go back to the sources, the few Ilamite sources uh, related to the king, Kutelutu Shinshushina. So we have only five bricks, uh, five brick inscriptions from Susa. You know, Hilamite uses to write, uh, the Hilamite king used to write their names on the clay uh, of the bricks used in the buildings of generally temple palaces. And uh, each of uh, these five inscriptions uh, is attested in several exemplars. All of them uh, are of the Takme or Takime type, that is, uh, there's a long list of uh, people, uh, parents, uh, and, sorry, sons, uh, nephew uh, of the king, and uh, the inscription, uh, the dedication, the votive dedication to some god is for the life of the king and his uh, family. Anyway, the most interesting inscription comes from Anshan, so not from Susa, but from Shan to the east, because it is the only Middle Elamite royal inscription found at Talemalian, which is one of the main centers of Anshan, not far from Persepolis, from Persepolis. This inscription is attested in seven fragments pertaining to at least three exemplars, and above all, in one entire brick whose provenance, unfortunately, is unknown, plus two never published copies and so on. So there are many uh, copies that are not very much useful for the context, for the archaeological context. So, and the Malian brick is of the same type of the Takme inscription. So, in sum, we have a Babylonian grant mentioning Kutelutu Shinshushina in connection, in connection to his mountains. We have a royal inscription in his name found at Tale Malian in Anshan. From this couple of facts arose a methodological short circuit, in my opinion, because we have sur surmised that Kutelutu Shinshushina escaped into the mountains. It is a methodological error, which I would call the coincidence fallacy, which is in turn a consequence of the so-called positivist fallacy. That is the assumption that the extant historical evidence documents significant events of the past. 
If we had a full record, the full record of the past, probably we would have had many other bricks or inscription of Kutelutus in Shushinak, both from Susiana and Anshan. And we would have had many other inscription of middle of Midhilamite kings from Anshan. Having a very restricted sample, it is tempting to find coincidences in it. There are many other examples of this coincidence fallacy. For example, the tempting idea to find the reference to the statue of Marduk in the generic description of plundering by evil Hilamites, and so on. Probably many other statues were taken, both of Marduk and other deities from several cities, and in different episodes, historic episodes. In the end, having proof for a late Bronze Age crisis in the ancient Near East, we assume that it was brought to Elam in form of a military crisis by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. As we have seen, this chain of assumption is based on a very scant evidence, which, taken alone, is not very much meaningful. So it is not clear why, taken together, it has to be illuminating. Thank you very much.